Welcome to Life Giving Water Messages, where I expound upon the Word of God and, through the internet, deliver it to you. Today's message is delivered by Kathleen Meredith, a certified lay servant in First United Methodist Church of Newton, and she has an awesome gospel filled message for you today based off of John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. So let us dive into the word today. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, You are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for this word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. John Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist religion, was born into a strong Anglican home with a father who was an Anglican priest and a mother who taught religion and morals daily to all of her 19 children. From his mother, John obtained a strict devotion to religious practices. He attended Oxford, proved to be a fine scholar, and was soon ordained into the Anglican ministry. Wesley said that he had a a sublime view of the law of God and resolved to keep it inwardly and outwardly and as sacredly as possible. Believing that he could find salvation through a rigid and resolved determination to follow God's law. John Wesley's brother Charles also attended Oxford, where the two brothers started a group for the purpose of study and the pursuit of a devout Christian life. Members of the group met every day from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. to pray, to read the Psalms, and to study the New Testament in Greek. They prayed every waking hour. During every hour that they were awake, they would take a minute or two and stop whatever they were doing and pray. They started out every day by asking God to give them a special virtue, such as wisdom or patience or generosity. They fasted every Wednesday and every Friday from waking until 3 p.m., and then they took the money that they would have spent on food and gave it to the poor. They preached, they educated, they paid off the debt of prisoners and debtors' prisons, 
cared for the sick, and set up free pharmacies. Because of their strict religious practices, they were mocked and branded as religious fanatics by their classmates, who called them Bible worms and <gasps> Methodists. While it was meant as a term of derision and ridicule, the group, especially John Wesley, adopted it and wore it as a badge of honor. Wesley faithfully recorded his daily activities in a diary, writing down which resolutions and which laws he failed to keep. He ranked his hourly temper of devotion, his religiosity, on a scale of one to nine. John Wesley studied the scriptures, performed his religious duties diligently, deprived himself so that he would have alms to give to the poor, and yet for all this religious activity and devotion, Wesley couldn't shake the feeling that something was missing. He became obsessed in his pursuit of holiness of heart and life, which led him to accept an invitation to become the resident priest in the newly founded parish in Savannah, Georgia. He and his brother Charles saw it as an opportunity to revive primitive Christianity by evangelizing to a primitive people and in, in, in an untouched environment. Now something happened on their sea voyage over to Georgia that further deepened Wesley's spiritual confusion. At one point, a violent storm struck the ship and broke the mast. Wesley, along with most of the other passengers, hid below deck, terrified that the ship was going to sink and that he was going to die. As he cowered and prayed in his bunk, he heard a strange sound. Between the gusts of rain and the crash of waves against the ship, he heard the sound of people singing not in the hold of the ship, but from the deck of the ship itself. When the storm stopped, Wesley went on deck and met the singers. It was a group of 26 German Protestants who called themselves Moravians. He asked their leader, how could you sing God's praises during the dark of the storm? The simplicity and truth of their bishop's reply stunned Wesley. We sang because we knew that God would either answer our prayers and bring us through the, through the storm or bring us home to be with him. Their faith and trust and confidence in the face of death and his absolute terror and lack of faith convinced Wesley that these people possessed a faith and an inner strength that he lacked but had so desperately been searching for. And so he began attending meetings of the Moravians in Georgia, and later when he got back to London, in the hopes of learning and acquiring the secret of their great and unshakable faith. Today's gospel lesson introduces us to a man who came to Jesus seeking that same information. What is the disconnect in my relationship with God? The man's name was Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jewish people, a man of wealth, and clearly a seeker after truth. For the most part, the people who surrounded Jesus were ordinary people, fishermen, farmers, laborers, but not Nicodemus. He was a man of wealth and privilege. And while others were condemning Jesus, Nicodemus, to his credit, wanted to learn more about him and his teachings. As a recognized leader in the community, Nicodemus probably had all 613 laws, or most of them, memorized, or knew exactly where they could be found in the scriptures. He knew the moral laws forwards and backwards. He knew the dietary laws, the civil laws, the criminal laws by heart. For decades, Nicodemus taught these laws and enforced them. If the law wasn't clear enough, the Pharisees made other laws to go with it. They hung laws upon laws that never came from the heart of God. Both Nicodemus and Wesley went on a quest to solve the mystery of their confusion and unrest. It seemed that the more they tried to follow the law, however, the further from God they felt. 
So Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, a time associated in mythology with confusion, ignorance, and temptation. John loves double meanings. Nicodemus came under the cover of darkness, probably so he would not be seen, but he also came under the darkness of ignorance, of not knowing Jesus. I think a lot of people can relate to Nicodemus, good people, responsible people, who contribute to life but just do not know Jesus. We don't know why, technically, why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. He may have been eager to ensure his privacy and protect his reputation. He could hardly be consorting with a vagabond preacher and troublemaker. All we know is that this worldly man of power and wealth opened himself to Jesus in the hope that out of the darkness of the night, he would come to the brightness of a new spiritual understanding. He came to Jesus, if not with faith, at least with faithful curiosity. Jesus lets us know not so much what was on Nicodemus' mind as what was in Nicodemus' heart, what was troubling Nicodemus' soul, something that even Nicodemus may not have been consciously aware of. As the Apostle Paul, I'm sorry, as the Apostle John points out, Jesus didn't need anyone to testify about themselves because Jesus knew all people and knew what was in everyone. That's from John chapter 2. What was in their hearts? What was in their souls? Which is why Jesus' response to Nicodemus' flattering introduction seems to come out of left field. I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. With all his religious training and experience, with all his wealth, with all his accomplishments, with all his standing at the temple and within the Jewish community, Nicodemus couldn't see what Jesus saw immediately, that Nicodemus was dead, spiritually dead. And Nicodemus' response proves Jesus' point. Nicodemus' response is based completely on human, not spiritual understanding. What do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus tries to explain it to him. I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. Jesus told Nicodemus that no one could see the kingdom of God without being born again, without being spiritually born from above. The kingdom that David built was a physical kingdom made out of physical materials, one built with human hands, one that could be seen with human eyes. In the minds of the Jews, the Messiah would be a physical person who would overthrow the physical nations that were oppressing Israel, and then that person would build what? An earthly kingdom, a physical kingdom that would rule over this physical world and all of its people for generations. Jesus was trying to explain that he came to build a spiritual kingdom, one that Nicodemus couldn't see because he was looking for it with physical eyes, human eyes. Just like he couldn't see the wind with his physical eyes, just as he couldn't see the problem that was troubling his heart and soul with human eyes. The solution to what was troubling him wasn't to be found in the physical or human realm, but in the realm of the spirit. Later in the chapter, Jesus explains the difference between physical and spiritual birth. The one who is of the earth, physical people like you and me, belongs to the earth and speaks of earthly things. The one who comes from heaven, the one who descended from heaven, he's speaking of himself, is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, yet no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. Think about this for a moment. 
Can any of you here describe heaven? No, because none of us have been there yet. The only way we'll get to heaven is to die and ascend to heaven. Jesus, on the other hand, can describe heaven because he has descended from heaven, from the spiritual realm to the physical realm of the earth. What Nicodemus and what John Wesley and what a whole lot of people fail to understand is that when it comes to things of the spirit, there is nothing that the flesh can do. All your hard work, all your study, all your sacrifices, your birthright, none of it will get you into the kingdom of God because all of these things are of the flesh and the kingdom of God is of the spirit. The only way to enter the kingdom of God is by water and the spirit. Eternal life has nothing to do with how long we live or what happens when we die. Eternal life refers to a quality of life we can know now and by God's grace will continue to experience beyond this mortal existence. But it starts now. The world can't destroy it. You may be pitifully poor, but have eternal life. You can be unemployed, terminally ill, crippled by broken relationships, but still have eternal life. Eternal life means that when all seems lost, you are most irresistible to Jesus. In verse 8 of this reading, Jesus said, the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. Jesus is saying that God's Spirit is like the wind. We can't see it, but we know that it's there because we can feel the effects of it. When we open our mind, when we open our thoughts, when we open our hearts to the reality of God's Spirit, we discover that it's everywhere, like the air that we breathe in and out, a thousand times a day. Jesus told Nicodemus that faith is a mystery. Like the wind, faith comes, but we cannot see it coming. It's not a human achievement, not an intellectual accomplishment. It's a gift from God for Christ's sake. Faith is like healing. When a doctor treats a person, the patient doesn't have to understand human anatomy or medical technology in order to be cured. Faith is like that. We don't have to understand. We only have to align ourselves with God in order to have our lives transformed. John Wesley discovered this truth most unexpectedly one evening and documented it in his diary. Impressed by the peace of heart and mind that the Moravians seemed to possess, Wesley started attending their meetings in the hopes of unlocking the secret of their faith and inner strength. What happened is that God breathed his spirit into John Wesley's heart on the evening of May 24th, 1738. He attended a Moravian meeting on Aldersgate Street that evening, where he heard a reading of Martin Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. Something happened to him as he started walking home. Hear about it in his own words. About a quarter before nine, while Martin Luther was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone for salvation and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John Wesley couldn't do a thing to cause his spiritual rebirth. He was merely coming home from his thousandth Bible study when the light broke into his spiritual darkness. He went from trying to change himself from the outside in to letting God change him from the inside out. Nicodemus and John Wesley thought that they could somehow reach up to God by their many good works and accomplishments, through their devotion and adherence to the law of God. But that only showed them just how far from God they really were. But that too was the grace, 
the breath of God blowing through their lives. Before we can understand what God's grace is about, we must first be made aware of our total spiritual bankruptcy before God. The law revealed the truth to Nicodemus that we are totally lost and beyond any human help. The law revealed this truth to John Wesley, which caused his heart to be troubled and restless. What Jesus was trying to tell Nicodemus is that earthly wisdom and understanding are incapable of understanding spiritual realities. For all their learning, Nicodemus and Wesley were incapable of understanding basic spiritual truths. This transformation into the life of the kingdom is not something that we can attain or obtain on our own. Our human efforts will never get us there. But God's grace doesn't leave us lost. Jesus wanted Nicodemus to know, Jesus wants us to know, that despite our total bankruptcy, spiritually, morally, and emotionally, there is hope. A hope that comes from above, a hope that comes from God, and that hope is Jesus. John Wesley's heart and life were changed that night on Aldersgate Street. For Nicodemus, it took a little longer. He came in darkness, and he left in darkness. But later in the gospel, we see Nicodemus standing up for Jesus when Jesus was being challenged by the Pharisees. We see Nicodemus go from being a secret admirer of Jesus to a fearless upholder of justice on Jesus' behalf. When Jesus' inner circle of disciples all but desert him on the cross, it was Nicodemus who took Jesus' body down off the cross and helped prepare his body for burial, making his love and devotion for Jesus public. I believe it's safe to say that Nicodemus was born again from above. How does spiritual birth happen? By the Spirit, quickening, convicting, assuring, counseling, by the Word, bringing light into our darkness, by Jesus, who descended and was lifted up, by God, sending his Word, his Spirit, his Son, Focus on the final two verses of today's gospel reading. John 3.16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And the often ignored verse 17 continues, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. God wants to give you spiritual life. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to bring you into his kingdom. And all he asks is that you put your trust in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Do that, and you will live with him forever. If you're willing to do that, then Jesus will indeed breathe new life into your unborn spirit, and you will walk out of the darkness and into the light, the knowledge of God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit of God, invisible like the wind, we do not see you moving among us, in us, but we see the effects. Come into our hearts so that we may be born and renewed from above, so that we can move out of darkness and seek the light of your truth and grace. Open our minds so that, so that we may perceive your kingdom. Open our eyes to the truth of the cross, a symbol of our spiritual healing, so that we may believe, and in believing, not die, but have eternal life through him who in your love for us descended from heaven, that we might ascend and be with you forever. In the name of Jesus, who died our death on the cross. We pray. Amen.